Hi, and thank you for signing up with the contact form at Graph CMS. I'm not going to get in your way any further from what you are actually wanting to see here, which is why we made you go through that process. Today, we are going to be looking at common UX patterns in the web for e-commerce in particular. We're going to be covering a wine shop today. So essentially, our product card is going to be a bottle and it's going to be the price and description and some reviews. Nothing breaking ground here in terms of e-commerce, but it's something that we see commonly. And in this particular case, we'll be stitching together three different services to accomplish our combined effect. We're going to be using Graph CMS as our PIM, which is the product information management. We'll be using Hazura for our authenticated user application content, uh, which is our reviews. And then we'll be using a really great e-commerce startup called Commerce Layer, which will handle our inventory, warehousing, prices, taxes, everything that a person must pay to enjoy a good bottle of wine. If we look at the application here, this is the simple car that we'll be building today. So you can see on the left, we have that product image. We have an ability to toggle through the various wines here. And you'll notice the content updates as we go through. We have an availability check, we have the prices, we have an ability to add it to a cart, and we have some basic review information. You'll also notice that what I've added here is the ability for the color to be alternating between the red wines and the white wines, essentially adding a, a bit of variance to the visual aesthetic here. There's going to be a technique that I'll be describing later on in this video about how we accomplish something like that without directly co-locating our presentational logic and our, and our content. Uh, or if you want to break it down, our design and our code. So before we look at the actual code or the tools that we'll be using today, I wanted to do a breakdown with you about the how this actually all comes together. So I have a little presentation that we'll, we'll do as a walkthrough and look at what the actual uh, architecture of our application is. So I put the A in parentheses here. This is a modern stack. It is not the only way to build web applications. There are a lot of ways, but this is the one that I've chosen and the one that we'll be using together today. So ultimately what we have is the coordinated SaaS stack. SaaS being software as a service. And these are three different services that are all hosted on different servers and we put them together into a new server which is where our application is going to live. Graph CMS is going to be the primary service that we use for our server side generated content. This is a static website that is then populated with dynamic pieces later on. After that, we have the live content coming from Commerce Layer, which will update our inventory and our pricing. And then we'll have Hazura, which also updates live content for our reviews. The concept here that's very important for us to bear in mind is the idea of using our SKU as a primary foreign key that attaches all three of these services together. So the first step is we get the product information from Graph CMS and we bring it over into the application. So we grab the product information, we pull the SKU off for reference and that product information populates the page. We follow that up with the actual commerce information, which then adds in the availability and the pricing. And the last component, we utilize the SKU again to pu pull in the reviews. Now that's a bit of a misnomer there because technically we're firing off the application content, the reviews and the pricing information simultaneously. But in this case, this is the bounds of my animation abilities. So starting with the bottom of our stack, we're going to look at the editorial content. This is what your marketing team would normally want to be adding in colorful descriptions, images, a look and feel to the application that really becomes the brand and the core of the content that you're really contributing as a marketing team. We have the uh, title, we have the, the vineyard, we have the descriptions, we have the country of origin. We have then the individual ratings for the flavor profile of the wine itself. This is all coming from Graph CMS specifically. We also have the hint for 
how many bottles we recommend somebody were to buy and for leveraging some kind of a discount or simply buying more product. Moving up the stack, we then have commerce layer, which provides our, our e-commerce content. So we check the availability, which is just looking for if we have available quantity. And then we have the actual pricing information. Uh, what is avail what's the price, taxes, based on my region, what's gonna be the, the rough cost here. I haven't gone into those details in the uh, code of this project because it goes beyond the scope of what we wanted to demonstrate here, but this is all possible using Commerce Layer, which has fine grain shipping and pricing and everything else that you could really want. And the last piece of, of content we're delivering here is from Hazura, which is gonna be our hosted backend as a service. And that has our average rating and it does have aggregation functionalities in the API as well as then the uh, reviews coming from the product. So let's take a look at the framework architecture. Our architecture is built on Next.js. Next.js is a very powerful application because it allows us to leverage multiple paradigms in modern web application construction. Primarily, we can mix both server-side generated and server-side rendered and React's front-end dynamic code abilities so that we can essentially cover every case that you could imagine for a modern web application. How it works in the code side of Next.js is you have a file called a SKU, which is in these parameters. It can know this is a dynamic parameter to be updated later on. So our initial GraphQL query then simply just goes to get the paths at build time. Again, this is a build time process. It gets the paths and will populate all those pages. What happens then, it does that query, it finds these three different SKUs, and it'll generate a page for each of those. Once the page has been, been staged to be created, it will take that SKU and it will go back and it will then try to get the rest of the content for each of those pages. So it'll grab the title, the description, the image, everything else that you would need for each of those special SKU segments. You can see colored in green, the mapping. So on SKU one, two, three, that's what's passed into my query for very specific product data for that page. And then we have that coming in, populating the page. So title goes to the title, the description goes to the description and everything else. At runtime is when things change a little bit. We'll then run a another query. Hazura, in this case, supports GraphQL. So we do another GraphQL query to Hazura, passing in that SKU as our primary foreign key. And it then fetches all of the reviews and fills in the average and the actual review content itself. Now, Commerce Layer is a REST endpoint, and that has a couple of endpoints that allow us to fetch the content we need. Again, passing in the SKU itself as part of the parameters, we're able to get back both the quantity and the price. So, let's look at how these services tend to look uh, on the interface themselves, and we'll see a little bit how this has been set up. First up, we'll have a look at Hazura. And if you look here in the application, you'll see that we have a couple of data, a couple of tables here. We have the author table, we have the review table, and we have the product on the review. So I'm viewing the review table here. We have the product SKU attached here. That is how we connect these two together from our code. I pass the SKU from GraphCMS in as a filter on the query to get back all of the reviews for the specific reviews we're looking for. Author is going to be the same sort of thing here where it's essentially attached as a username to the review. Azure is a very powerful platform. It can accommodate many, many cases where you need to have fine-grained access controls and webhooks and functionalities and everything else that you could want for a modern backend as a service tool. It pairs so great with GraphCMS because you leverage the ability to use GraphQL in both ecosystems, and you can even use remote schemas to combine the two into a single API. Commerce Layer is the commerce provider for our project, and while it is out of the scope of this video for us to dig through everything that it can provide and do, I just wanted to show briefly what the interface looks like. You can see that we track inventory, you can see that we track uh, SKU lists, uh, we can see that we are able to track prices and promotions and shipping, 
and we even have access to any sort of pending orders that might be available. Everything that you would want to track in terms of e-commerce is all there, it's all available. And what's great about e-commerce is they really understand this idea that the serverless architecture of today is leveraging best of best of breed uh, services that can say we focus on one specific thing. So Graph CMS focuses very specifically on on content management and specifically even in our case content management that needs some some mutation abilities or some writing abilities or so some some support for a little bit of a crossover into that backend as a service ecosystem. What Hazura does great is fine grain access controls for for incredibly high volume amount of of user generated content and what commerce layer does is it says we do warehousing and we do pricing and taxes and shipping and the, none of them are trying to step on each other's toes they all solve individually unique parts of the problem all right the last interface that i wanted to show you is the best and that is graph cms uh, and we wanted to just quickly look at what the schema is behind this project here so if we look at the schema here, and schema is a combination of our types, our individual content types that we use to build up a project, what we have is product at the beginning, and that product is composed of a number of fields, so the title, the SKU, with some validations on there that it needs to be unique, it needs to be a required field. And moving on down, we get to an interesting portion of our project here, and this is a relation, but it is a union type relation. With these union types, then we can support different kinds of products that have different levels of attributes that we would want to use in different places. So if I had pants in there, inseam and waist, if I had uh, shoes in there, I could have shoe size. All these attributes are unique to those products and yet I still want to keep them underneath the canonical reference of product which shares a SKU, which shares a title and a product image. This is a similar effect to database normalization, if you're familiar with that kind of uh, terminology, where we break out our model into self-contained, repeatable, and non-unique non ent entities in our tables. Moving further on on the product, uh, so we have then a region. The region can be attached. We can see the reverse side of the relations here. They are attached to uh, the wines themselves. They are attached to the vineyards. That's where we generate our country of origin data, actually. We have the ability to see the varietal, the kind of uh, wine that it is. We can see the, the vineyard, where it's located, all the addresses. And if we go into the content editing interface here, we can actually see how this looks a little bit, where we can see a specific wine that we've created. We can see the uh, Zinfandel, and then we scroll down, we can see the type of wine, the vineyard that's been attached to it, the region, uh, and then our ratings for the flavor profile. I'm not going to go through more of the interface now. There's an opportunity later to sign up for a demo of the application where one of our developer advocates and our, our salespeople will be happy to show you the in-depth parts of the application. For now, we're going to move on to the code and see exactly how that works together. All right, we're coming to the code now. I am going to move quickly here because this is not intended to be a technical breakdown about all of the features of Next.js or what the code looks like. Some top level things to know, I'm using React.js as the framework and that framework itself is abstracted into another framework called Next.js and that is what I referred to earlier on in the conversation and I'm just gonna point out a few key highlights here. You can see that as we break this down, if I come to the pages directory and I've dropped this down, I have products and then I have my SKU. And if we come down here, we'll see just how easy it is to query content from Graph CMS. So all I'm doing here is I'm getting the static props. That's what we're doing for this static build. And here I can just read very cleanly the query of content that I'm pulling from Graph CMS. That is one of the benefits that I find about GraphQL is that it is really just so readable where you can go in there, you can see all of the fields that, you're being pull that are being pulled in. I can onboard a new developer and they would be able to see right away what it is that we're actually pulling into the application. So it's very straightforward. Uh, it's obviously code, so there needs to be some familiar familiarity with code. But beyond that, any person could come in, see what I'm doing here and be able to get up and running right away.
Inside of my product card then, we're gonna to move to the components. Now I've just scoped these out and broken them down for a little bit more visibility and ability to track uh, what content is being used where. But here we just have a simple product card that is pulling in some things like a title, it's pulling in the descriptions, it's pulling in the country of origin and our prices. Now the prices themselves are coming from, again, coming from Commerce Layer, and that's using a library that they provided that all I have to do is pass in a SKU at a top level wrapping component, and then it's able to say, oh, here's your prices, here's your availability, here's what your current cart inventory looks like. Again, that's what you get when you choose best of breed providers without grabbing one monolith trying to do everything. You're able to find a company that says, hey, we're going to focus on just this specific area and provide really great services for just that problem. I mentioned briefly the idea of abstracting these color utilities out of our code. Now, a lot of times it is a, a old habit from marketing departments that really want to be able to control colors and they want to control everything else inside of the CMS. That is a really... That is a antiquated approach to content marketing now because now my marketing person has to be both a UX expert and a designer and they need to understand a little bit of HTML and CSS and all these features where really what I want my content team to be is really great at writing content. And when we abstract out essentially design tokens in the CMS to say, I don't need to have my, my content person tell me what color the primary focus or emphasis of my pages, but I do need them to annotate this piece of content just enough to tell me this is the primary focus or this is something that should be displayed data dense or full screen. And here I have taken the wine type, pass it into a design token function, and what that does is it simply alternates through my colors for me. Let's look how, let's see how that plays out inside of the actual design that we've created. So here you'll see that this purple is what is being derived from a red wine type. And as I go through the two reds, they are both the exact same, but if I go to a white wine, then I get that yellow highlight. Now I've just done a very high level utilizing current color uh, CSS hacks or cascade, if you will, where I simply reuse that color all throughout the application. It's not a bad strategy. It's something that you can definitely do as well but I've been able to then abstract a design token into an attribute of my data model without actually saying yellow or purple inside of my content editor. I was able to abstract these pieces of data into a design token that has a mapping in code, primarily because the code that I need to show this color would not be the same way that I would produce that in a printed brochure, is not the same way that I would do that in a mobile application, and is com uh, completely irrelevant when it comes to something like a voice experience. However, I would be able to perhaps abstract that voice experience into something that is white wine-esque. Who knows? So the, the concept here that I wanna convey is that you can map a design language to attributes in your CMS, in your content model, and not have to focus on providing color support or other features. You can abstract these away and be able to create really efficient code. Okay, and that is it. You made it to the end. I really appreciate you watching that whole video. If you will sign up for a demo at the end of this, we will be walking you through, again, a lot of this interface, specifically the Graph CMS side. We can show you this demo, another demo, and we will give you a in-depth tour of what it is you can do with Graph CMS. We really believe it is one of the most powerful and flexible interfaces out there, and we're just really excited that you are showing interest and can't wait to see what it is that you will build. Thanks. Bye.